Hi everyone and welcome to this week's crime and punishment story. This week I am covering the very sad and tragic story of Jane Elizabeth Ferguson and the murder of John Nelson which took place in North Shields in 1884. I hope you will find it interesting. But before we begin, can I just say, if you do enjoy this video, then please give it a thumbs up. And if you are new here or haven't already done so, then do please consider subscribing to the channel to help support the content we create. Thank you. And I would just like to add, as I always do, that I do record these stories live, so I do sometimes make mistakes, which I always try to rectify. So I hope this does not spoil your enjoyment of the video. Sadly, this again is a story where there is very little information on the backstory of those involved, so what I have is quite basic. Jane Elizabeth Ferguson was said to be around 31 years old in 1884, so would have been born in around 1853. Her place of birth and parents are unknown. It was known that she was a widow and she lived in Churchway in North Shields. It's not known if she actually worked, but she was described as being a char lady. It is also known that her neighbours often gave her food when she did not have any, but no mention is ever made of her being a drinker. John Nelson, the victim, was born in around October of 1883 and was not even one year old at the time of his death. He was said to be the illegitimate child of Jane Elizabeth Ferguson. In early October of 1883, Jane complained to one of her neighbours of feeling unwell. It was quite early in the morning and the neighbour suggested that she should send for a doctor if she was so ill, but Jane said she did not need a doctor as she knew what was ailing her. She then went to her room and locked the door. Later that afternoon, Isabella Reader, Jane's neighbour, knocked on her door to ask her to come down to her room. Jane did so, and when she arrived, she told a young girl who was visiting Isabella that if she went upstairs, she would find a fine baby boy. Isabella also went to the room and saw a baby boy who seemed to have been recently born. Jane told her the baby belonged to a young girl who was not able to take care of it and that she had brought the child home that, so that she could look after it. Nothing more was thought of the situation until around nine months later when the neighbours, who by now were used to seeing the baby, noticed he was no longer around. This made them so suspicious that they sent for the police. Detectives Riddle and Thompson went to visit Jane at her home. She did not clearly explain where the child had gone, but she also did not give them any great reason to investigate further, so they left. They visited again the next day, and again, although Jane did not completely ease their suspicions, they could find no reason to suspect anything had happened to the child, and they did not visit her again. A few days later, Jane confessed to a friend, Margaret Brown, that the baby boy had died. She said he had died of natural causes having been ill with diarrhoea for some time. Margaret found the baby in the room where Jane lived. The two detectives were sent for and as they were already aware of the suspicions of her neighbours on seeing the body, they quickly decided that Jane must be arrested and charged with the willful murder of the child now known as John Nelson. The inquest took place at the town hall in North Shields before Coroner Lynn. No details were given as to who had identified the body of John Nelson. However, it is known that at least one of the neighbours had seen the child in the room of Jane Ferguson and had stated it was the same child they had seen there in the months previous. Isabella Reader said she lived in Churchway in North Shields in the rooms below Jane. She stated that in October of the previous year, Jane had spoken to her one morning complaining of feeling very unwell. Isabella said she suggested that Jane should send for a doctor, but she said she knew what was wrong with her and did not need a doctor, so she then suggested that Jane should go to bed. And after this, she said Jane went to her room and locked the door. Later that afternoon, she said she knocked on the door of Jane's room to invite her down to her own room. She said Jane came down alone, but when she was in the room, she told a young girl who was visiting at the time that if she went up to her room, she would find a fine young boy. 
The girl went up with Jane, and Isabella said she followed a few minutes later. By then, she found Jane sitting with the baby on her knee. She said it was a male child and recently born, and seemed to her to be fine and healthy. Jane told her the child was not hers, it belonged to a young, young girl who she had been taking care of, and she had brought the baby home to look after, as the young girl could not cope. Isabella said that prior to the appearance of the baby, Jane had been a rather plump young lady, but after this she seemed to quickly lose some weight. From that day on, she said she saw the baby often, and for the first few months it seemed to thrive and looked well taken care of. But she said then he began to look sickly and seemed to suffer from diarrhoea a lot. Jane Ferguson, Isabella said, was a very poor woman, and she often gave her food for herself and milk for the child, and she thought that some of the other neighbours did the same. She said the last time she had seen the baby alive had been on July the 26th, and at that time he was very poorly. He always seemed to her to be very hungry, although she did not actually mention if he cried a lot. She stated that she had often told Jane that she should send for a doctor for the baby, but she would reply saying that she did not need a doctor and that the boy was healthy enough. Margaret Brown said she lived in Church Street in North Shields. She said she had lodged with Jane Ferguson until around two months ago. During her time there, she said Jane was always kind to the baby boy and fed him often. Margaret said she felt that he was quite a delicate child, but during her time there she did not see him suffering with any illness. She added that Jane had said he was not her child and that she had been looking after him for someone, but she did not say who. She said on the Friday night, previous to the baby being found, she had been sent for to go to the home of Jane Ferguson, as the neighbours had been concerned for the child as he was missing. She said Jane told her that she had given the baby away to someone in the back lane. She herself did not believe this and she decided to stay overnight with Jane and she kept asking her about the little boy and eventually Jane told her that the baby had died and that he was still in the house. She said she found him in a cupboard and she took him out and placed him into a box in the room. She said Jane told her that he had died a natural death and that she planned to bury him if she was able to. She said it was also at this time that Jane told her the child was actually her own and did not belong to anyone else. Margaret said she did not feel that Jane had taken care of the child well. She did not feed him good food and milk always came from a bottle. And she, like Isabella, said the last time she had seen the baby alive had been July the 26th when he had seemed very ill. Margaret said that after finding his body, she had informed the two detectives who had previously been to see Jane, telling them that the child had died. She said they came to Jane's home and arrested her for the willful murder of her baby, John Nelson. Detective Riddle said he first went to the home of Jane Ferguson when the child was missing. She had told him that an old woman had met her in the back lane and that she had given the boy to her. She had said it had been the same woman who had brought the child to her to nurse the year before. She had told him she did not know who the woman was, but she had met her in the lane every Monday for the past year when she had been given money for taking care of the baby. He said she then told him if they gave her some time she would try and find out more details about where the child was. Detective Riddle said he returned to her rooms the next day and Jane said she had done all she could but had not been able to find the old woman and could not tell him any more about the child or its mother. He said he did not fully believe her story but there was no evidence to suggest that the baby boy had come to any harm at that time. He continued by saying that a few days later he was called to the house by Margaret Brown and here he found the body of a baby boy less than a year old who appeared to have been dead for some days. Detective Riddle ended by saying that when arrested and taken to the police station, the only statement that Jane made was to say, It is my own child. I have made a bad job of it. I should have told you the truth at first. He said the body of John Nelson was also taken to the police station where a doctor was sent for to examine him, and he said that he appeared to be little more than skin and bone. Dr Bates of Savile Street, North Shields, said he had performed the post-mortem on the body of John Nelson. 
He was very underweight, weighing only around six pounds. He had marks on his skin that he had seen before in children who had suffered greatly from diarrhoea. He said he noticed a few small marks on the child's head that may have happened due to a fall, but these had not contributed to his death. He stated that he believed the cause of death was persistent diarrhoea, caused by improper feeding and a lack of medical treatment. When asked, he said the child had not been able to absorb food properly for some time, and being so ill he would most likely have not wanted to eat. He did not appear to have taken any food for some days, and anything that he had eaten would have passed through his body very quickly. One of the jury members asked Dr Bates if he felt that the mother had neglected her child, to which he replied that he could not truly say, but no one could approve of the fact that she had not sought medical treatment when the child had been ill. I did not find any details as to what the coroner said in his summing up of the evidence, but we can assume that he would have asked the jury to consider if this was a case of deliberate neglect or neglect due to not having enough money to properly take care of her child. The jury retired for only a few minutes before returning a verdict of guilty of manslaughter against Jane Ferguson, and she was committed for trial and taken to Newcastle Prison. I did not find any evidence of a funeral for the baby boy, John Nelson. We sadly have to assume that no one was able to afford to pay for this burial, so this may have been another pauper's funeral. I also did not find any evidence of a headstone anywhere in the area for John Nelson. And I did not find any details of who his father was. Jane, it seems, never spoke of the father or named him, and it does not appear that anyone came forward to say that John was their son. It would be at this point that we would normally move on to the trial, but, as in some other cases recently, this was another case where there would be no trial. When the information was brought before the grand jury in October of 1884, they decided to throw out the case and Jane Ferguson was then free to go. No reason was given for their decision, but it is possible that they simply felt this was not a case of manslaughter at all and that the child had died, not through neglect, but simply because the mother was unable to afford the food to feed him properly or to afford to send for a doctor to treat his illness. I did not find any further information about Jane Ferguson after this date. This, I'm sorry, that was my headphones falling off the arm of the chair. I hope you didn't hear that. This was an incredibly tragic story. From the start, it is clear that Jane felt some kind of shame for having a child when she was not married. But in 1884, this was the normal way to feel, as having a child out of wedlock was frowned upon. She obviously still wanted the baby as she did not give him up but instead told people he belonged to someone else and she was just taking care of him. However, it sadly seems that she was not able to look after him, with little to no money to feed him and quite possibly no money to afford a doctor when he was ill. It seems this story was only ever going to have a sad and tragic ending. I don't believe that she meant to starve him to death. I think she was trying the best she could and was perhaps too proud to tell people that she could not afford to pay for his care. This resulted in the poor boy dying in a most awful way, and even when then she seemed unable to tell people what had happened until she was forced to do so. Often in some of these cases I feel that the judges and jury etc are wrong in their decision, but in this case I think the grand jury were correct to throw out the case, as I think Jane had suffered enough already. But what do you think? Do you think this was a case of willful neglect or do you think Jane had tried her best but simply wasn't able to cope and with perhaps no family close by there was no one to turn to for help? And do you think the grand jury were correct to throw the case out or do you think that she should have been tried for manslaughter? Do let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I do hope that you have found this very sad and tragic story interesting and I do hope that halfway through the video you didn't actually hear my phone ringing it. I forgot to turn it off. I normally put it onto silent but I didn't on this occasion and it was ringing so I do hope that you couldn't hear that. And as going back to obviously that luckily went through that part without making any mistakes which was quite 
good considering the phone was very off-putting. But anyway, I do thank you all very much for watching and I do hope to see you all again very soon.